Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. And as Carol said, we're going to talk about VGP, but not the networking protocol VGP, but rather black swans, gray rhinos, and pink elephants. So I, I named it that because uh, I thought it would be a, an interesting way to start to talk about a topic that many of you might be familiar with, and that's cognitive biases. So let me tell you how I sort of arrived at this point. So in June of 2021, I was preparing for a meeting and I was thinking about uh, risk frameworks and uh, awareness and sort of different programs and different aspects of a security program. And uh, at one point, I had uh, what Samuel L. Jackson calls in Pulp Fiction, a, a moment of clarity. And, and I was really thinking about why is it that we continue to um, look at frameworks and tools and a variety of approaches but sometimes it feels like we're not making really significant progress, right? And so my, my uh, moment of clarity was, well, maybe there's some other factor or factors that are really impacting us in a way that we can't really see. And, that, and that's really what cognitive biases are. Cognitive biases are things that we can't really see, we can't really see into our own minds, um, but I think that they maybe are impacting the way that we think about cybersecurity and the mental models that we use. And so what we'll do today is we'll step through some of those um, and, and talk about uh, what those impacts are. And then, of course, we'll, we'll talk about tips and tricks and things that you can do um, to start to well, work your way through that to mitigate that. So take a look at this slide. I mean, it is an eye chart. <laughs> and I did that on purpose. I mean, is overwhelming the amount of cognitive biases that have been identified. So, so let's step back and talk about where this construct or concept came from. So it really came from uh, Daniel Kahneman and his longtime collaborator, uh, Amos Tversky. And they started writing about that, researching and writing about this really in the, in the, the 70s and 80s. And it started to sort of reach you know, sort of popular mainstream. Uh, and then in 2002, uh, Kahneman uh, uh, received the Nobel Prize for his, his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And hence the, the, the subtitle of today's lecture about thinking more slowly. So what do I mean by thinking more slowly? Well, um, one way of, of looking at how we interpret information and data and then, and then decode that is that there's system one and system two, and this is Kahneman's uh, construct. And uh, not very uh, sassy name, but that's what he calls it, system one and system two. And system one thinking is uh, almost automatic, it's subconscious, and he calls it quick and dirty. And, and so what he means by that is it, it's very fast and it's uh, usually simplistic things. So if I ask you, what is two plus two? That's system one thinking, the answer is four. And it's, it's immediate and you really don't have to consciously pause to think about that. System two thinking, on the other hand, is very slow and it's deliberate thinking. And it's really what, when we're talking in, you know, uh, in our everyday world and we say, oh, he's thinking really hard about this, that's what we're trying to indicate, right? Is that slower, deliberate thinking? Well, why the two systems? Well, from an evolutionary standpoint, what we believe has happened is that system one thinking, which is mostly in control on any given day, is very efficient, right? And it's efficient because uh, one of the techniques it uses is heuristics. And those of you who are in behavior analytics or, or a related field are, are probably very familiar with this. And heuristics are just shortcuts that the brain takes to try to arrive at an answer. And, and a way to think about this kind of in the day-to-day the -day world, if you're explaining it to your kids, is an optical illusion is that same sort of phenomenon. In other words, uh, our, our eyes and our brain uh, were create, you know, evolved so that we uh, expect a single light source, which in our case is the sun, right? And so we look at shadowing and distance and, and different points to understand um, how to interpret the world around us. What an optical illusion does is it takes advantage or it tricks that, right, um, to make it seem like a, a painting that you're looking at has a, has a point in the distance, right, because of converging lines and the shadowing. So a heuristic is a, a quick shortcut way um, that the brain operates, uh, which gets us through our day-to-day -day life, because most of the time we don't have to have complex, slow thinking. And um, the other reason is that um, it, you know it's efficient in the sense that the brain is sort of lazy; it doesn't want to use all that energy, which it, it absolutely requires more energy 
to do system two thinking. So there's at this point been a number of studies that have looked at your uh, blood sugar levels and, and other indicators, and it truly takes more energy to do system two thinking. So system one thinking, uh, quick and dirty, system two thinking is slow and deliberate. So system two thinking is where we wanna sort of turn our, our eyes, our, our thought process in terms of how we might uh, solve for this, some of these challenges that are sort of underlying this. So this, uh, this, this picture is really overwhelming. So let's take a look at a kind of a, a redacted or reduced picture that's a little bit simpler. Uh, and this is recent, this comes from Olivier Sabone. And uh, he, he's, he uh, groups these into five uh, families that are kind of related types of cognitive biases. And some of these are probably familiar to you because uh, we do use them uh, in our day-to-day -day world, especially in, in cybersecurity and, and IT. And one that's not called out here is uh, correlation versus causality. And uh, I certainly have had that conversation in the hall with folks about, hey, is this just a correlation? It just happens to be these two or three facts are, are coincidental, or is it really a cause, right? And I've highlighted a couple that uh, that you might have talked about in your in your own day-to-day. -day. So confirmation bias, the halo effect, right? We all hope we're the beneficiaries of the halo effect. So when I meet Carol for the first time and have a great impression of her, that impression stays with me. And it's actually has kind of a gravity to it, um, if you will. And so sort of anything subsequent to that, um, I will give Carol, Carol that halo effect of, well, she's just a great person and warm and friendly. Um, and that's how the halo effect works. So if you're a hiring manager, uh, then this is something that you're very familiar with. You want to make sure that you're really looking at um, all the all the facts and the, the characteristics that you're hoping for in that candidate. Loss aversion. I have a, a funny story about loss aversion. And that's when I worked at it with a company, and I was at the headquarters one day in California, and um, this was a uh, this was a time in where there was uh, you know the foosball tables and the ping pong tables, and that was like very very popular, and um, there was a lot of giveaways and things for the employees and. I was listening in the overhead and they announced that an employee had won a thousand dollars, which is a really cool prize. Right. And so they announced it sort of early in the morning um, and they were, of course, really jazzed up for whatever set of reasons. There was actually multiple awards that were being you know, given out and they ended up getting eight hundred dollars. And I happened to bump into them in the cafeteria later on in that day. And instead of being ecstatic that they had received $800, they were actually uh, sort of surprising to me, sad, because they felt like they had lost $200. And so it was, it was really interesting um, that they internalized it that way. And really, that's how a lot of us do. So loss aversion is this idea that losses are way more painful to us uh, than a positive event happening. So that's that's an example again in in day to day world and the group think we, we've all seen this the ability so uh, if Carol Laura uh, Laura and I are all in a meeting um, it's possible that Laura's uh, very energetic uh, and a great speaker and very engaging and very confident then it's it's likely that we'll sort of rally around that um, in, in a group think way and sort of just agree because it feels comfortable and, and that's what's what happens in some of these biases as you see that's a social bias and that's why that happens so. Uh, this is a handful of those. There's no need to memorize these, or, or but it but it might trigger some discussion with you um, when you're thinking about how do I want to deal with these uh, in my own realm. So with that, let me take you to my next slide, and that's um, what we're going to get into the topic today. So black swans are a phenomenon. I think that's pretty well known, but if if you're not familiar, um, prior to the late 1600s. Uh, Europeans had not seen any swans except white swans. So swanness, if you will, was was automatically white. That was just built in because that's the color of the feathers that they saw, right? And it wasn't until Dutch explorers arrived in Australia that they realized that there were black swans. So this this notion of an unpredictable, surprising event has been around for quite some time. So that's a black swan event. Uh, gray rhinos comes to us from Michelle Walker, and I'll dig into that in the next session um, in the following week, and we'll talk about what a gray rhino is, and then pink elephants, uh, which will be session number three, and those are things that are already in the room and we're sort of just ignoring. So we'll dive into those later, but let's go into the black swan event. So in terms of popular um, language and, and how we talk about this today, um, Nassim Nicholas Taleb really highlighted this uh, concept that again had been around for quite some time, and, and he brought this forward and said, you know, there, there's aspects of this kind of event 
um, that we should look at, and then how can we respond to those? So, so in his determination, there, there's really there's really three aspects of a black swan event, and, and the first one is the one that we're probably painfully familiar with, and that is that it has to be um, widespread and it has to be drastic in terms of the consequences, the impacts that it has. The, the second characteristic from Taleb's standpoint is it has to be unpredictable, right? There has to have been really no way in advance that, you know, with the data that you have, that in a reasonable way that you could have predicted um, that that event was about to happen. And, and then the third thing is, is one, one thing that we're going to dive deeper in today, and that's hindsight bias. And, and, and the way that Taleb frames black swans is that hindsight bias always has a piece uh, uh, of that event. So let's talk about what that is. Hindsight bias simply is the fact that after the fact, when you have all the information and you're looking backwards, right? What happens with the brain is that you start to create a narrative, right? Um, so we learn through stories and we, and we share information through stories. And so <clears throat> what the hindsight bias is, is looking backwards with all the information that you have today, and you may be familiar with the phrase hindsight is 2020, right? Um, that when you have all the information after the fact, then it's really easy to construct what feels like a, a really linear narrative. And that's just a, a it's not um, a, a sort of a conscious effort, right, on your part to do that. It's simply how the brain works, right? We walk through our days, um, you know, creating a narrative, both of who we are and how we fit in the world and how everybody else interacts with us. So um, hindsight bias is always at play when you're talking about a black swan event. So black swan event is drastic and wide ranging. Um, and it's an unpredictable in nature and it has hindsight bias. So what would that look like in sort of the, to the day to day world? Well, one of the examples uh, that is often given is World War One. Um, prior to that, nobody had really um, estimated or with the data that they had at hand, could have predicted that the, that that World War One played out because of all the agreements between the various countries. Um, it was really shocking to everyone when it played out that way. So that's an example, sort of from the from the past, and, and a more current example that's typically given is uh, the 1987 stock market crash in the United States. And again, at the time, with the data that that people had, they wouldn't have predicted that 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 market um, bubble would occur and that there would be a stock market crash. So those are examples from sort of our day to day lives. And so what I would throw out to the audience uh, just for contemplation is um, in the cybersecurity realm, what would you think of as a black swan event? So there's a couple of obvious things that come to mind and, and you know, and, and we can we can chat about what's the characteristics and doesn't meet the bar. But you may have said something like the solar winds event. You may have said log for J. Um, it's an interesting conversation to, to decide. Is it really a black swan event or not? But it's a good exercise to think about, you know, what are the black swan events? Um, and then we'll get into uh, more importantly, what do we do when a black swan event occurs? This is a great quote uh, that I pulled from the, 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 the CISO of Expedia uh, from a podcast, and I just thought it really hits home uh, sort of the, the, some, you know, the, the bottom line when it comes to a black swan event, right? And this is a great example of, of Charlie sort of indicating what hindsight bias is, right? We, we all have plans for a pandemic now that we're in one. And, and that's just a great encapsulation of, of the issue that you just don't see it coming um, and then maybe afterwards, people are like, oh, I, I saw all these factors and I absolutely could have known. And maybe the answer is maybe, maybe you could have. But at the time, uh, there was no widespread, uh, you know, agreement that 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 event was going to happen. Right. Again, it's only when you have all the facts later looking back that you can create what we think of that that narrative, that that linear narrative. Right. So. Um, I want to just throw this out to the audience. So I, I, we've touched on a few biases. I gave you some examples sort of from a day to day standpoint. So um, which of these is one of the causes of black swan events? OK, so confirmation bias, confirmation biases is, is I, I tend to seek information that confirms a belief that I already have. Right. Loss aversion. I give you that example of somebody who won a thousand dollars, but then it was actually eight hundred dollars. Right. And then hindsight bias. So hindsight bias, according to Taleb, is always at play when you talk about a black swan event. So it's very hard after the fact to determine, well, what, what did we know? 
what should we have known and how could we have reacted to that? So hindsight bias is really at play when you talk about black swan events. This is a, an article by Taleb Goldstein and Spitznagel where they, they highlight more specifically kind of in a risk management standpoint, what are mistakes that executives make? And they have six listed here and you can scroll through these and think about, you know, are these ones that, that, that I have made or my team has made or I've seen, you know, I've observed this, but six is too many, right? So as a presenter, I know I can't give you six. So let's, let's boil it down to two. I think these two of the six are really ones that I wanna highlight from a learning standpoint and ones that we should think about. So predicting extreme events, right? So we spent a lot of time thinking about extreme situations, extreme events. And the reality is that if it's a black swan scenario, you really can't predict that event. And here's the other thing that's related to that and that's studying the past will help us ma manage risk. So um, I, some of these are a little bit controversial, but I wanted to throw them out for contemplation. So predicting extreme events, and studying the past. So according to uh, Taleb and his co-authors, these are two things that they see as mistakes that are frequently made by executives or executive teams. So that of course leaves us with the question of, so what do we do about this, right? Um, if we can't predict it in advance and it's not really helpful to study the past in a really deep way, so what do we do? I, I believe that the answer to uh, effectively um, managing your way through a black swan event is to focus on resilience and recovery. So, right. So rather than spend a tremendous amount of time gaming, you know, why could this thing happen? And, and if it happened, um, who was responsible and what were the factors that were at play? When it's a black swan event, you really can't do that. And interestingly, I, I threw this out to uh, the LinkedIn audience about a week ago. And, uh, and David Spark from the CISO series actually responded very similar to this. And I was like, oh, you're almost stealing my thunder. So he, he mentioned this, right? That you, since it's unpredictable, you really have to think about how you adapt and how you're creative. And I think those are great words as well, right? Being adaptable and being creative. So in a black swan event, the, I think the strongest uh, case that you can make in terms of learning and preparation is to really focus on resilience. So in other words, Focus less on why would the thing happen and exactly how would it play out at sort of the beginning of the event and, and, and spend more time thinking about if really bad thing happened, how would we then respond to that really bad thing? How do we make sure that we have resilience in our communication and our process and our thinking with our, 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 ourselves and our employees? And then how do we recover from there? So let me touch on the, the thinking and what we know now from research is that when you're under a stressful situation or you have a lack of sleep uh, or lack of food uh, or a lot of other background factors, it restricts your thinking so that when something surprising does happen, our vision is very, very narrow. And so there's, there's two things that you can do in that scenario. One is um, to have practiced uh, ahead of time and, and, and be aware that you're, you're, you're needed really processes and, and run books and, and gain theory there to help you. And the second thing is just to acknowledge that and realize, hey, you know, am I short on sleep? Am I short on food? Am I stressed because of maybe other factors that are happening right now? And to, to be aware of that so that you can step back and, and understand um, what, what's impacting your thinking. So let me give you three specific tips as it relates to Black Swan events. And I'm going to use the acronym PTI. So the P is a pre-mortem analysis. So many of us are familiar with postmortem. Of course, that comes to us from the field of healthcare. Uh, for those of you who, like me, uh, have a background in the military, we often call them after action reviews, right? Um, you, you'll see uh, different terms for this, but we're more familiar with that after the fact, a thing happened and I get together with my team, the other stakeholders, whoever else was, was involved, and we look at, well, why did this happen? What do we think the causes were? But it's all after the fact, right? So we know from hindsight bias that we'll then construct a story, right? That is very linear, it's very logical. Um, often there's more than one bias that is at play. So we might have confirmation bias. That, oh, I knew it all along. I knew this was gonna happen, right? And so you start to discard the facts um, that, that later you decided don't matter to the story. So what is a pre-mortem analysis? Well, a pre-mortem comes to us from Gary Klein. 
And interestingly, uh, it was one of Kahneman's uh, favorite techniques. So I think that's really a strong statement about this, about somebody who spent decades thinking about these topics. So what's a premortem? What a premortem is, is instead of going in the way back machine, going in the time machine backwards and thinking about, well, what could have happened and what led to this and why did it happen? And how did it play out? Who's at fault? How do we respond to that? A premortem is an exercise that you do in advance. And you say, what are the what possible things could absolutely go wrong um, ahead of time? So if you're seeing that logical fallacy of, well, wait, we, we don't know exactly what's going to go wrong because it's a black swan event. You're right. So here's what I mean. What we should think about is don't fixate on what the thing is. What is the negative thing? So something negative is happening and it's impacting your operations. It's impacting your access to data. It's impacting your customer's access to resources, all right? So don't fixate on that part of it, but do think in the future of once a bad thing happens, what then would trigger a series of other bad things after that? So how is our communication flow? Do we have uh, run books? Do we have backup plans, not only physically uh, and, and logically for our data, but also for our people? So if uh, Carol and I work on a team, what if Carol's on PTO? Like, what's that plan look like, right? In the, in the most effective way, according to the research, to do that pre-mortem analysis is not the way that we sort of historically think about brainstorming. So brainstorming, we all get in a room, we have squishy balls and, and uh, candy, and, and we start to throw ideas out and we put it on a whiteboard. That's a super fun event. What the research shows is it's not the most effective way to do that. The most effective way, believe it or not, is to do it individually first. So if you're going to do a pre-mortem analysis, what you should uh, do is have individuals write down on a piece of paper, once that bad thing happens, what other bad things could then cascade off that and have them write that down on a piece of paper. And interestingly, the research shows that an individual will actually come up with more uh, high number of ideas and qualitatively better ideas. So have everybody write their ideas down on a piece of paper or if you're using a platform uh, because you're, you're uh, decentralized, uh, do it on a platform and then have everybody turn those in. And what that does too, is it sort of takes away that, that groupthink bias where um, Carol has a great idea and we're all like, oh my gosh, yeah, this is a great idea. And we start to just make iterations of that idea, which are subtle, but aren't really new ideas. So in a pre-mortem, Think about what a cascade of uh, negative impacting events could be and and say what would go absolutely terribly wrong and think about it ahead of time. Write it down and then review it as a team. So the P and PTI is pre-mortem analysis. So what's next? What's next is an exercise that, that we're often familiar with, and that is T for tabletop exercises. So here I'm showing you one for the military because I thought it was just a simple visual that everybody can sort of understand. So tabletop exercises uh, in cybersecurity, in my experience, um, often are a great uh, workflow and communication exercise. Uh, where I see sometimes gaps in tabletop exercises is it being done from uh, the individual small team manager level all the way up through the executive level. So let me give you an example. I was in a two day tabletop exercise uh, with a consulting firm and it was very well run and there were great scenarios and, uh, and it was awesome. And as we got to day two, I had one simple question that was uh, the groups were sort of split up in tables, right? So there's networking, operations, security, IR, there were the, the sort of tables of the different folks, which in itself was a little bit interesting, right? Uh, that they were split up into their, their kind of their pillars, their domains, their silos. But what I noticed was there were no executives in the room. Right. So I've seen it sort of go both ways. I've seen executive tabletop exercises where there's no folks in the room with them. Right. No VPs, no directors, no managers. And then the other way around. So here's my comment and observation on tabletop exercises. Make sure that you're doing it all the way uh, left, right, up and down inside your organization. So if you're doing it at your level, your team level, awesome. Are you doing it with related teams? So. HR, logistics, transportation, sales, marketing, whatever the other domains and teams are in your organization. And are the executives doing that? So if you're an executive, you should be hopefully encouraging the others um, and, and creating an opportunity for them. But if you're not, it's a great question to, to talk over with your boss and your boss's boss of, hey, how do we do tabletop exercises at the executive level? Because often that's the visible external part that, that customers and partners would see, right? Is that executive response. So. So PTI, so pre-mortem 
tabletop exercises. So what is the I? The I is inject chaos. So you're probably familiar with the chaos monkey constructs and ideas from Netflix. So this is an idea um, that, that we've been using in the military for quite some time. That's injecting chaos. So let me give you an example. I was a planning and operations officer for the US Army. And so I did lots and lots of tabletop exercises. And, and one technique that we would use to inject chaos is to uh, hand somebody a three by five card or a playing card or a slip of paper um, that only went to that individual. And it, it gave them either something to do or to say, or frankly, to withhold. And what I mean by that, well, there's always those other factors at play. So as an example, uh, if we ran an exercise and it went pretty well, then we would rerun it and I would start handing, uh, handing out basically chaos cards. So we would say something like, um, you were up really late because your, uh, your, your two-year-old is sick and so you're really tired and your thinking is deprecated and you actually gave the wrong number for XYZ thing. And so you can inject chaos into it, not just at a code level, right? It was sort of how we think about it from a, a chaos monkey standpoint, but you can inject chaos into your planning, but also into your tabletop exercises. So I would encourage you to do that. If you run a tabletop exercise and it goes pretty well, you know, 70%, 80% of your objectives are achieved. Think about injecting some chaos as you go through that process, because that's much more realistic in terms of um, what really happens, right? So, so pre-mortem tabletop exercise, inject chaos. So those are three tips and techniques that you can use. So I thought this would be fun to bring it full circle. Uh, so we have black swan front and center, right? Right in the middle of that slide. So my question is, what are these three books? Uh, the one was they're, they're turned the, the ones on either side were turned into movies, but what do these all have in common? And can anybody tell me? Uh, what these all have in common is that this is not the author's first book. So Silence of the Lambs had a precursor uh, called Red Dragon. Da Vinci Code, as you can see down there, was actually Angels and Demons was the first book. And similarly, Black Swan was not Taleb's first book. It's perhaps the best known and it was a bestseller. Uh, and it's the visual that we use when we think about this, right? But for me, I, I think it was more helpful um, to go back to first principles. So. I happened to run across Fooled by Randomness years before Black Swan was kind of a day-to-day -day talking point. And I just thought it was really fascinating. And he touches on these heuristics, these cognitive biases, and he plays it out in different ways um, around the economics and financial markets and things, but they're really some simple stories. So if you wanna get grounded, if this is not an area that you're really familiar with, then Fooled by Randomness uh, is a great place to start. Thinking Fast and Slow is a, is a pretty thick book, and so it takes some time to sort of wade through that and, and look through all those examples, but Fooled by Randomness is a really simple way uh, of picking up uh, where this comes from. So Black Swan Events. So to, to re recap, there was an acronym that I gave you for Black Swan Events, and that acronym is PTI. So conduct pre-mortems do tabletop exercises up, down, left, and right throughout your entire organization, and consider injecting chaos in those tabletop exercises, in your response drills, uh, in your workflow, so that it's the best way to prepare yourself uh, for this unexpected event. So back to that adaption uh, and that creativity. So with that, I want to, uh, to say thanks to, to the SANS. I'm sure you're all familiar because you're on the, the live stream with us today. There's so many great courses uh, and, and events and live streams. There's uh, free ones that are coming up. There's also, of course, the structured courses here that I'm showing you. So um, strongly encourage you to get involved with SANS. It's a great community. There's a ton of sharing that goes on in SANS. And so I just wanted to highlight that. I wanna thank everybody for your time and attention today. Again, this is part one of a three-part series. So black swans, gray rhinos, pink elephants. Today we talked about black swans, those unpredictable, unexpected events that are drastic in terms of consequences and often involve the cognitive bias that we call hindsight bias, looking backwards and pretending that the entire time we knew how this was gonna happen. So uh, that's it for the, the formal slides. And uh, Carol, with that, I'll, I'll uh, jump to Q&A. All right, thanks for that great presentation. I'm not currently seeing any questions in the Q&A feature. However, if anyone has a question for Dutch, please enter it now.
It was very quiet today. <laughs> well, Carol, I mean, this is a topic that kind of crosses, uh, you know, uh, realms and, and roles and responsibilities. So anything that uh, you didn't know or you found interesting about the, the topic today? I think that it might be a bit over my head. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did enjoy all the references to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, like I how did. you brought me in as part of the <laughs> Carol, you're part of you're part of you're part of my extended team, Carol. You're I like it. Team. I like it. So I do see. Right, one, I, do. I see one question in there yep. about TTXs, right? So um, so tabletop exercises. How often should you run those? I, I don't have. I don't think that there's a blanket answer. So what I what I say is that you know, start um, like the crawl, walk, run, I think actually is the right approach. So there's, there's sort of two approaches when you're building out those kinds of exercise and programs. The one approach is on that one end, I will call the uh, the Tony Stark Ironman approach, which he says, you know, sometimes you have to run before you walk, right? And so that's the approach where you just dive in, right? And you go ahead first. So sometimes that makes sense. But really, I would say with, with TTXs, um, you should build out a, 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 a pro, you know, a program for the year, right? So look at your end state and say, hey, by Q4, we want to have uh, TTX with, you know, um, this level, this many teams across these, these domains, right? And then sort of back into that. So that way, maybe you're saying, okay, well, that means in Q1, I need to have a TTX, you know, with, with my team. So maybe that's the, you know, 5, 10, 15 people. So I would, again, I would start small because there'll be some learnings that you'll have um, in that smaller group setting. Uh, and then you can duplicate those with other adjacent groups. Maybe it's uh, the, a development team, maybe it's um, product uh, management or IT or, you know, a team that will have common language that'll be easier for you to start with. And then you can build up to sort of more complex, um, multi-team, uh, multi-domain uh, TTXs. So I don't think there's a specific frequency. I typically, what I can tell you, I observe like at that executive level or at that high level is like, a, you know, a couple times a year typically uh, is what I see that sort of at that executive level. But I think at the you know director manager team level you could you could shoot for trying to do that once a quarter. And and it will also note that one one of the challenges I see sometimes in tabletop exercises is um, who's sort of being the, the host or the moderator, right? So if it's the executive themselves, what I have seen is um, it, it's challenging then if there's two or three levels of employees in the room. Um, you get back to that sort of that group think and those social biases that start to play out, right? So it's often uh, great to have um, a devil's advocate, a host, a moderator, you know, whatever kind of culturally works in your, your environment um, so that there's somebody who's, who's sort of making sure that um, one person's uh, opinion doesn't sort of get, like I said earlier, give too much gravity, too much weight, right? And it's often unintentional. But we know from research that people who are seem really confident are very extroverted and are really comfortable talking that those those folks will um, uh, unintentionally sometimes uh, sort of trigger that groupthink bias that we talked about. Looks like there might be another question. Hey, Billy, how do you avoid success bias when running a pre-mortem with a team that may be too close to the problem? So I, I would look at um, somebody else that you trust in terms of their opinion and really look at some diversity, right? So diversity in any of these uh, scenarios is always really helpful. So and by that, I mean all the kinds of diversity, right? So neurodiversity, cultural diversity, diversity in terms of education and background. So whatever you can do to get more diversity, we know absolutely will change how you um, mitigate biases, right? And again, biases are built into the way our brain operates. You cannot um, really look into that system one um, because it's essentially a black box, right? Um, it's why we're also really, it's really easy, uh, Billy, for me to point out that that uh, logical fallacy or bias in somebody else's thinking, right? Because then I'm actually observing and I'm using my system too to observe you, right? It's really hard for you to do it yourself. So awareness is helpful, but what we find is actually having a devil's advocate uh, is much more impactful. And so I would look to um, find somebody who does have a divergent uh, set of background, um, neurodiversity, um, you know, than your team to try to mitigate that. That's how I would think about um, trying to avoid the success bias. And a related bias that is um, a scenario where we only look at the, the winners, right? And so you see this play out sometimes in the, uh, in the media or, or in the, the realm of, well, we think a particular individual from that company, it might be the CEO as an example, 
that that one individual created all of the things right um and then you you, know, you want to go read a book by that individual and sometimes it is really helpful because you could internalize that however that survivorship bias does come into play which is really closely related to success bias which is will uh, billy's point here survivorship bias says well we're only looking at the winners right so we look at oh well um, Carol did great. She was a great leader. And we would say, well, let's model ourselves after how Carol does things, right? But we're not looking at the other nine Carols, if you will, who maybe tried some of the same things and it didn't work out. So you should just always be conscious of that. Look for diversity uh, when you're running these tabletop exercises. And again, have uh, a moderator, a devil's advocate, um, whatever your structure is that lets you do that. But that's really, really important. I've seen that work, by the way, both in the, 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 the Department of Defense realm as well as in the civilian realm. So I'll talk about that. We actually had that role. So when I was in, uh, an army officer, you, we would get assigned um, to be that. And, and we had some different names for it, but it was essentially um, being a devil's advocate. And so you were often, to Billy's point, from a different team. So I'll give you an example personally. I was given a project where I had to look at something that was happening in finance. And that was not my, my domain, not my area of expertise. And they do that on purpose. And, and one of the things that comes out of that is, I didn't know anything. <laughs> I knew there was a problem that was that was that was you know um, I was given. It was like, hey, we're having this issue. We don't really know why this issue is happening, and so I didn't have any sort of passion or bias. I hope about that because it wasn't something I understood very well. And so I just went and asked a bunch of questions. Hey, um, Billy, how do you do this? And I watched how they do a the thing. And then I would go, okay, well, and where does the process go from here? And who are those people? And I essentially just interviewed everybody. And eventually, I spotted what was a flaw um because there were two different parts of the process and they just didn't click together correctly but both humans thought they had submitted and you know done all the right things in the workflow um and then i could go back to the general and present that and say okay here's here's what you know, here's my analysis here are the interviews i did and here's what i found and even because i didn't have a sort of a dog in this hunt as we say where i grew up in, in, in rural midwest um, it, it, it didn't, you know, didn't trigger me. Like I wasn't not upset one way or the other. I was just sort of dispassionate. Like, hey, here's what I found. Um, and I've seen that as well in the civilian realm. So I've worked for multiple large companies and will often have a, a, a bias buster or a process buster or devil's advocate or that kind of role. So I would strongly encourage you to, again, whatever's a good cultural fit for your, for your entity, for your company, for your enterprise, but think about that because you really do need to give that to somebody and rotate it around right so if i'm the person who's the devil's advocate this week then it's carol next week and it's lara the next week and then it's billy the week after that right so rotate it around because it takes the burden off of everybody and it also you're going to get different insights by having different people so so that's a technique or some techniques that i've seen in different realms be uh, be effective when you're running those uh, exercises and ways to try to mitigate that so um any other questions uh today just look through here. Do I see anything else? All right, Carol, do you see any other questions? Oh, what other reading do you recommend? Okay, that's actually a great tee up. Um, I have a slide um, in case that came up here. Let me just kill the Q&A screen. Sorry about that. So um, here's some books. Here's some courses if you're into more kind of structured training. And here's a few websites, right? So uh, these are, it's not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the key resources that I used uh, to do, um, you know, uh, my understanding, to build my understanding of, of how these work. Uh, the courses, the first one's, uh, I kind of picked different ones. So the first one's uh, uh, Udemy, the second one is LinkedIn Learning. So they're both great courses. There's, there's multiple courses on critical thinking, which is related to this topic. It's sort of, it's broader. Of course, critical thinking would include uh, logical fallacies. Those are a little different. A cognitive bias is really an outcome of that system one thing. It's just an, out, an accidental uh, outcome of how your brain works. Whereas logical fallacies are more like um, you, you made an incorrect assumption at the beginning of the discussion and then you followed a path and then just didn't come to the conclusion that you know, a reasonable person would come to. That's a little bit different. So, But critical thinking um, courses and books will often touch on that. You'll see a little bit of this in some recent books, even in the cybersecurity realm. So Sunil Yu talks about uh, the framing bias in his most recent work, uh, Cyber Defense Matrix. George Finney sometimes uh, has touched on on uh, biases in sleep. Um, there, there's, so you're starting to see some of this uh, come into the, the cybersecurity realm as well. Um, these two courses are great. The first one is, is, a, is a pretty exhaustive, so it really goes through 
here's a cognitive bias, here's why it's caused, here's a kind of, I mean, it's really kind of a structure. So if that's the type of learning that's really helpful to you, uh, I'd encourage you to take that one. And then the, the one by Becky Saltzman, she actually does a number of courses. I just pulled out this one because I thought it was the most uh, applicable. Um, but this is, this is more of a, what are the tips and tricks that you can use knowing that these cognitive uh, pitfalls exist? Uh, and then these are two websites uh, that you could go to dig dig deep. Um, of course, that first slide I showed you, that was the eye chart with the 200 and something. You can go to Wikipedia, you can go just sort of Google cognitive bias and you're gonna get a, just a ton of info. But what I hope I've done here is just sort of prune this down to um, you know to a reasonable amount of those. So, and this will be in the, uh, the PDF file um, that'll be uh, published afterwards. So you can get that. Uh, or you can certainly hit me up. Um, LinkedIn is probably the simplest way to reach me. Uh, I'm not really active on Twitter because it's uh, it's hard to stay stay active on that you know all day throughout the day in uh, in my workflow. But um, you will see me be on LinkedIn and, and be active in discussions. And then I see a question from Charles: Tips on getting a busy clinical a cynical sorry a cynical management team on board with frequent tabletops. So uh, I I don't th know that there's a one size fits all lever for that, right? Um, so it's going to depend a little bit on your influence and the culture of those executives. So um, what we know doesn't work is fear, uncertainty, and doubt, right? I mean, so sort of shocking or scaring people into to try to you know encourage their behavior. The, the results are very low, very qualitatively low on that working. So I, I guess what I try to do is find an advocate first, right? Find somebody who uh, is simpatico with you. Um, and that's probably a coffee conversation or a virtual coffee conversation. And so I would probably step down the path of, hey, we, you know, there's a there's a body of evidence and there's and, and let me do this a different way in fields where failure is not really an option. So NASA, uh, the military, the triple letter agencies, right? Um, in those fields, this is a very consistent common practice that has been around for decades. And what I would say is there's a lot of learning that has come out of that. So if that's a way of framing it, saying, hey, you know, um, this, is a, this is really important for us to look at because we know from critical fields, that this is a way for us to step through the learnings of that. Um, I would encourage that. And there's sort of, there's other kind of influence that you can put on that. I mean, there's definitely more um, executive level um, topical engagement on this type of uh, activity. And what I mean by that is, um, the uh, uh, World Economic Forum, uh, the NACD, which is uh, for, for directors of boards, um, the DDN, which is also a training uh, course for, for board directors. All three of those uh, have uh, articles on why um, cybersecurity and exercises of that are important. So if that's helpful, you know, if you have an executive or a peer who's, you know, would be maybe influenced by looking at something from the World Economic Forum, or from where the board's point of view is, we've seen, certainly seen this shifting, right? Doesn't mean your board or your particular team is there yet, but we have seen this shifting where um, cybersecurity is becoming a, a board level conversation on a, you know, not just with the risk subcommittee, but with the entire board on a quarterly basis. So if you're talking about it on a quarterly basis, I think that's maybe one of the ties as well, right? If we're talking about it on a quarterly basis, we need to be exercising that, right? And we know that it's going to be the coordination, the communication, the workflow, um, and uh, that will break down. And that's what you'll learn from doing the tabletop exercises. So hopefully they gave you some tips there, Charles. Let's see if there's any other any other questions. It looks like that is it for the questions. I'll give a pause in case anybody wants to pop one last one in. And if not, I don't see any other cues uh, coming in. So. Again, so BGP, network, networking protocol, but but black swans, gray rhinos, pink elephants, right? So these are three different types of events that happen. So today we, we picked the obvious one, the black swan. That's the one that most people are familiar with. I gave you a little bit of history on, on where that comes from, um, some topics to think about. And again, one set of techniques that you can use to mitigate black swans because you can't eliminate them, right? Because they're unpredictable. But what you can do in terms of once it occurs to you is that, that PTI. So it's pre-mortem tabletop exercises and inject chaos in your training and your workflow ahead of time. And then next week, we'll talk about gray rhinos. Gray rhinos are events that we did have some signal on. So that I'll just give you a teaser on that. So we had some signal, but for a set of reasons, um, we didn't act on that signal. And then the third week, we'll talk about pink elephants. And I'll leave that under wraps for now. So next week, I'll tell you a little bit about what pink elephants are. 
Um, but I think, Carol, with that, unless there's any other uh, questions that come in, um, we can wrap it up. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dutch, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming